So here I'm going to talk about mechanics. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in a community of people who appreciates and enjoys uh, 19th century physics like I do. Uh, it's unusual to hear people uh, talk about the different kinds of things I'm interested in and they also. Uh, I'm going to talk about mechanics of light and locomotion, uh, and I'm going to mostly talk about things that are done in my lab. Uh, to start with, can everybody who can understand everything I'm saying raise your hand? Okay. That means you have a job to do. Okay. Uh, so I would like, uh, I, I have a lot to say, and I don't have to say it all. Uh, it doesn't matter if we don't get to everything. Uh, most important is that you have a good time and that you learn something. So uh, you should ask questions. So anything you don't understand, either the English or the content, you ask a question and if it slows us down, I just won't finish. It doesn't matter. Okay. The broad goals are to uh, predict the motions of animals and uh, people are an example of animals, and the other is to get ideas about design for robots. So you can think of uh, animals as machines, and you can think of machines as models for animals. Uh, in this what thing I call forward modeling, which is you would like a model, but not just a model that is descriptive, but a model that makes predictions about motion. For example, a model that is, is sufficiently rich that you can do a simulation, you would like a model to generate a motion which is of the type that you like. For example, with locomotion, you want something that's moved. If it's on legs, you want it standing up and not falling down. Uh, if you want it to be look like walking, you want it to look like walking. Uh, you would like it to not use too much energy, and you'd like it to not fall down. So when, in the end, we want to generate models of locomotion that look like locomotion, don't use a lot of energy, and don't fall down. And this is, this is uh, uh, the main idea that we have in the background for all everything that I'm going to talk about. So the approach, you could call it biorobotics, is, is like I said, you think of animals as machines, and you think of machines as models of animals. And uh, you know, the word model in the most of science, most of science is biology nowadays, the word model has a different meaning than the word model has here. And here I have in mind, a model is a, a, a mechanical model, and I'm not going to talk about chemistry or biochemistry or even uh, about electricity. So we're just in the mechanics of, of, uh, of locomotion, and that's true for everybody in this room, I think. Uh, so, in fact, if you look at an animal, it has a brain and a nerve system, and you would like to understand the locomotion without understanding the nerve system, and there are two ways that you can go about this, and in my two talks, I kind of take these two extremes, which is you take the idea of a nerve system and you surround it. And we surround it with two ideas. One idea is you say, what can you do without nerves at all? And we don't have to think about the control system if there is no control system. And the other extreme, which I will talk about later, I guess after lunch, is that the nerve system is so good at what it does that you don't have to think about the nerve system. You just assume it's perfect. And you describe it by what it's trying to do. And whatever it's trying to do, it does perfectly. And therefore, we don't have to think about it. So uh, we don't worry about the in-between case where the nerve system is imperfect. And we have to think about it. Now, this is not quite correct. Most of what we do now in my lab is worry about uh, this, what's between these two. But I'm not going to talk too much about that. Okay, so part one, this first talk, is about uh, what's called passive dynamics. And passive means that there's no motors, uh, unless you think of gravity as a motor, and there's no electrical control. And, and by dynamics, you mean that things are moving. And the inspiration for this approach to locomotion, uh, as far as I know, comes from three uh, different ideas. And I'm going to talk about these three inspirations for passive dynamics. So the first one is uh, bicycles. And the bicycle story uh, goes like this. Uh, people can ride bicycles. Probably most of you can ride bicycles. But bicycles can ride themselves. And I will show that to you. But the, 
floating this jump to, jump to showing that to you and hope that uh, the projector is not, is not too slow on these uh, transitions. Not bad. I think we'll look better if we shut some lights down here. Good. So here is a uh, bicycle, and this is a bicycle that rides itself. And it's not a particularly special bicycle. I used to live in the countryside, and in the barn I found an old bicycle, and this is that bicycle. And it does, it does okay uh, riding itself. Uh, if you want to see uh, what this looks like, uh, uh, how it bounces itself is something like this. It's going along, you knock it sideways, and what happens is when it's falling to the right, it steers to the right, and when it's falling to the left, it steers to the left, and it does it not like a harmonic oscillator, but it, it makes a little less of a correction than a harmonic oscillator would make. And so the final motion is actually a straight ahead motion. It's asymptotically stable. Why did there no seats here? <laughs> Probably it was in my barn because it was missing various pieces and was not working. Uh, it would look better with the seat, but there's more, there's more things in the seat that are missing. There's no gears, there's no brakes. Uh, <laughs> It's not the drop this in this case. Now, if you have very good eyes, you'll see that there are uh, there is a significant defect in this bicycle uh, that actually makes this video work better. Does anybody know what the significant defect is? Do you want to pose the question to the audience for those? Какой дефект у этого велосипеда, кроме отсутствующего седла, мы видим? Что мы видим? Let's see. We can't, we can't, no, the keen eye would have seen this already. So, um, how do I play this again? Uh, moving. Take it as a puzzle problem, and I uh, will not discuss that defect. We can discuss it later. But it's, it's this, it's the key eye you can see the problem. Okay, it's not a problem. It just makes the video look better. Uh, this model, of the, uh, we can model the bicycle with equations, without friction, without dissipation, without control, and yet you get asymptotic stability. Uh, when I first discussed these issues with people 20 years ago, uh, this was a big surprise. Nowadays, to an audience like this, you know uh, many of you much more about this topic uh, than I do. But I used to get in arguments with uh, people like this. People thought this was a uh, this, that this was wrong, wrong mechanics. But this is not, I think, wrong mechanics. Okay, so what does this have to do with walking? Is uh, people can walk in their bodies. Maybe the bodies can walk themselves. See, people can ride it on their bicycles, but the bicycle ride themselves. Maybe your brain is riding your body, and when you're walking around, you're riding the body, and the body can ride itself like a bicycle can ride itself. Okay, that's the first idea. And that actually has been uh, very inspiring uh, for me, uh, at least a long time ago, it was inspiring for me. Okay, the second idea is from the Wright brothers, and the Wright brothers were these guys who invented airplanes, and they started out with a plane like this. This is actually not the Wright brothers. This is Akta Chanut, who inspired the Wright brothers. And the Wright brothers mastered gliders. And what are gliders? They're airplanes that fly downhill. And then they added a motor. And they added a motor with confidence. They wrote a letter to their sister. Tomorrow we're putting the motor on the airplane and it will fly. And tomorrow, they, and the next day, they put the motor on the airplane and the motor broke. But the day after that, they fixed the motor and they put it on the airplane, the airplane flew. That was the famous flight, one of the most famous photographs of all time of that, of that flight. So the idea for uh, walking robots is let's master gliders 
Let's make robots without motors, just like airplanes without motors. Make them work well, and then we will confidently add a motor, and then we'll have a real robot, just like we now have real airplanes by starting gliders. And uh, that's the worst idea I ever had. But I stuck with it for about 20 years, or 15 years. And, uh, inspiration number three is uh, toys. Here are patents of two toys. This one is an American toy from 1938, and this is the oldest documentation I have of a walking toy of this type, and this is from 1888. I don't even know what country this is, and it's a little wire toy. But the name of this patent is An Improvement on Walking Toys. So the idea is it's older than 1888, but I don't have any documentation older than that. But these toys walk, and I'll show you a video of this toy. It's called Wilson Walkie. And uh, this one is significant in the history of the subject because Tom McMahon, who was a professor at Harvard, had this toy when he was a kid. He used it as inspiration for a calculation I'm not going to show you. That calculation was inspiration for Tad McGear. Tad McGear made robots that really turned this into a science. And I, so it actually starts with this patent. Uh, so the idea here, well, let me show you what this toy looks like first. the Wilson walkie. It's a, it's a glider. It's walking, it's riding its body. There's no computers or anything in there and it, it walks down this hill. So the idea is to copy that design. Now, are there any questions? Say again? This is going down a slope of three or four degrees, something like that. Just like the airplane goes down. No, the glider goes down. And some motor inside. Yeah. Yeah. Is motor inside? Yeah. Or, or it is just free walking. It is just free walking. This is this is uh, three objects. There's the body, there's leg left, leg right, and there's a hinge connecting them, and the three rattle around to do walks down the hill. Uh, you can buy this toy on eBay for between ten and two hundred dollars. Uh, so now you want to analyze uh, toys like this after these three inspirations. So we have one, bicycles balance themselves. Two, the Wright brothers made gliders before they made powered airplanes. Three, uh, you there are toys that walk by themselves. So uh, this started to turn to a science. Uh, as far as I know, in 1988, with this guy Tad McGear, but then it turns out that uh, uh, Alexander Formalski had done uh, much of this earlier. Uh, and here's maybe maybe more than you need Jellet translated into Russian. We need Formalski translated into English. So he has these papers, but they are not in English. I don't know what they say in detail. I only know what he has told me personally. It would be nice if we knew what he did, and we could give him credit for it, but I can't, because I don't know exactly what he did. Uh, but Tad McGear worked this out. He didn't know about uh, Kromowski. You, some of you know this guy, right? Yes. I, I met a nice guy. Except he smoked cigarettes. Um, so here is a model. Uh, this is maybe simpler than anything that, that Kromowski did, or McGear did. Uh, it's just our attempt to make the simple, to, to, to do the simplest model of this downhill walking. So, how do you understand things? You make simple models. Most of you uh, have talked about simple models. So what we have is a double pendulum. So it's two sticks. Uh, there's a big mass here. There's two small masses here. Uh, the mechanics of this is going to be uh, that there's a frictionless hinge here. If a foot hits the ground, it hits with uh, no bouncing and no sliding, and that's the whole story. The question is, can this thing walk? Now, in fact, it cannot possibly walk, even in two dimensions, because the legs are equal length, and the swinging leg will hit the ground. So we cheat, and we say, if a leg is swinging forwards, and it's not swinging back, it's allowed to pass through the ground. So it's almost a pure mechanical model, not quite. 
Now, to make it as simple as possible, you write the equations in a dimensionless form. Then uh, you still have a bunch of parameters. For example, there's these two masses. So let's take the mass ratio to infinity. So this is an infinitesimal mass, not zero. In zero, you don't have dynamics, but just above zero, so it can swing like a pendulum, but not big enough so that the swinging motion affects this big one. Uh, and then this is a model that has no free parameters. So it's a simple model of walking, it's no free parameters, it either walks or it does not walk. We have nothing to optimize, nothing to adjust, nothing to do. Excuse me, uh, the time you calculate the reaction force in uh, back, back. I, I'm afraid that uh, uh, this uh, walking is impossible because the back uh, uh, should uh, to, um, uh, jump uh, before, before the impact. Because reaction force. Uh, okay, so we have this. Uh, uh, we. I wish I had two of these six. We have. Let's start at this point and assume everything is okay. This is swinging. This is swinging. The reaction force on this is positive. Uh, assuming that the motion is not too fast. Yes, but 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 we have here a device which is. So, so, so we need that. It's the same with the toy, because it goes yeah. that, that way. The toy, the, so there's two problems. One is the collision problem. I, I, I don't know if you're asking about the collision, but I'll answer that question. The other is the problem of this thing hitting. This one, this one we ignore. So in the calculation, we say this one can pass through the ground, and we let that go. So it's not, we cannot literally build this thing, or if you want to build it, you have to put a space in the ground for the left foot and then a space in the ground for the right foot and so on, which you can do. Now, are you, are you interested in that or are you interested in the problem of the collision, right, when this hits? Is that your question also? Do you want to help translate? Is that, are, are you asking? What? Yeah, uh, I noticed the movie you showed uh, initially touch the toy, I think, this way, right? The toy is three. The toy is three. The toy is three-dimensional, and the toy. The, this is in two dimensions. This is a flat model. It says nothing in this direction. The toy does something in this direction. That's correct. I, I'm not claiming that this is an accurate model of the toy. In the spirit of this conference, I present something physical, and then I present mathematics that has nothing to do with the physical object. <laughs> okay? This is just conceptual model of something similar. I, I will get back to physical reality. We'll enter this talk again, however. What do you think? Physical reality will enter this talk again. Now you have to decide whether something needs to be translated or not. I think it's up to you. It's you to decide which part to translate. I, I don't. I um, do you understand what I'm talking about? Uh, in your model, you have uh, you have a model of the uh, You will give back. Yes. Okay. See you. So in this two-dimensional model, we want to see, does this work? It's a well-defined mathematical problem. And the question is, when we put this onto the computer, for example, does this, does this have a walking motion? So you can start it in all different initial conditions, run the model. We have no choice about what the model does. And uh, you find there are some initial conditions where you get a periodic motion. And whether you get a periodic motion or not, and the nature of it depends on this parameter, which is not a parameter in the model, but a parameter in the force. If gravity is not a parameter, it comes out in, the, in making the equations dimensionless. What do the motions look like? The legs swing this way and that. Uh, the, you can look at the angles as a function of time. It turns out that we can find two solutions. There's two branches of solutions. One of them has a leg coming down like this, and one of them has a leg coming in and hitting like this, a scoffing solution. One of those solutions has is stable for angles that are below uh, this, like one degree, some teensy angle here. That goes unstable in period doubling bifurcation to chaos, which is 
interesting to some people. I have a friend who's interested in walking mechanics, and he says, I, I, ruined, I ruined the subject by, by introducing this idea of chaos because it distracts people from uh, what's really interesting. It's a dynamic curiosity. It's not interesting for robots and people, I do not think. One interesting feature here is that there are solutions all the way down to zero slope. So that even though we had this walking on a slope, this can walk on arbitrarily small slopes. But what happens is that the, this is the angle of the legs. As the slopes get smaller and smaller, the angle between the legs gets smaller and smaller. The period is roughly constant. Uh, it's a fixed time scale set by the double pendulum frequency. And so as the stance angle gets smaller and smaller, the speed goes to zero. The solution is down to zero slope, but there is zero speed. Now, you two are talking to each other, and you two are talking to each other, so please ask your question out loud. Yes? Yes? I was thinking about the 3D. Um, so how, how, how actually you can stabilize it? How actually you can say that these model walls, given that uh, any, any swing in the, in the outer plane, no, this, this is, in this the outer plane, it will fall. This is a two-dimensional model. It's a two-dimensional analysis. No, no, I understand, but when you say wall, I mean walk in two dimensions. I mean walking in two dimensions. I mean that the simulation is in two dimensions. Uh, we, can, we can think of that a few ways. We can think of that as constrained to be in two dimensions. Okay, so or we can think of only initial conditions in three dimensions that are in that plane, and we're not looking at unstable eigenvalues out of the plane. We're assuming that only initial conditions are in the plane. But this is, it's two, we're living in the world of two dimensions. Will you guys? Uh, you do this out loud? Other people want to know? <laughs> we, we just uh, discussed uh, your, your weather of uh, collection. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is good or bad? It, it, it is unusual. <laughs> for which I have periodic motions. So if we do the Poincaré map, the Poincaré map has two fixed points, two independent, isolated fixed points. And what about solutions? One branch of solutions is stable only for small angles. This is the dark one. These are all stable. And stable means in two dimensions. Stable means that all eigenvalues of the linearization of the Poincaré map have less than one in magnitude. Yes? Yes? Energy cannot possibly be conserved in this model because I have it walking downhill and I have it walking in a periodic motion. So gravity energy is going is being funneled through this machine all the time. So gravity energy is going in, energy's got to go out someplace. Where the energy goes out is when this foot hits the ground. No, they cannot possibly be because there's energy lost in the system. Where, where, where do I have dissipation in the equations of motion? When this is a double pendulum, the equations are conservative, they're holonomic, uh, they're Hamiltonian. They, but then part of the equations I have include, include the collision equation. The collision equation, when this foot hits the ground, you have to conserve angular momentum. Angular momentum conservation is not compatible with energy conservation, and energy is lost each time the foot hits the ground. So the smooth equations are conservative, but the discontinuous equations are not conservative. The net system is not conservative. Does that address your question? Yes, it does. 
So, are you happy with that? Is that what is it that you don't uh, like or understand about what I said? I don't understand what your chaos is in Lithuania or dissipated. It has to be dissipated. It cannot be Hamiltonian chaos. And all the involved constants there are in response to it. Say again? And all the involved constants is in this case the response to it. This is five involved period doubling. This is the classic period doubling. And no constants correspond to dissipated chaos or not? There's one five involved constant for period doubling. It does not have to do with dissipation. The period doubling is a generic property that can return map in one dimension, as far as I understand. So what's the physical phenomenon of the chaos? We cannot see the chaos. See, I told you my friend said this was a distraction <laughs> that attracts people. Uh, the physical phenomena is the following thing. Even a double pendulum is very hard for us under to, set, to understand. A double pendulum, even without collisions, has chaotic dynamics. A double pendulum is fourth order nonlinear differential equation. Nobody in this room has a good intuition for the trajectories of a particle in four-dimensional phase space. The reason it's chaos is because the world is complicated and there can be chaos. I do, I do not know of any case where anybody has given an intuitive explanation for any kind of chaos ever. Does, does anybody know a counterexample? All you can say is in three-dimensional phase space, there's room for complicated things to happen. And this is four-dimensional phase space. Or if you like, in the return map world, it's a two-dimensional return map. Okay. Uh, here's what Tad McGear did: is he he took this idea a step further. Actually, he didn't do the simpler model. He jumped to model like this. We went back and did that simple calculation. This is now a quadruple pendulum: one, two, three, four parts. But you make the assumption that this leg and this leg are never bent at the same time, so it's only a triple pendulum. The mechanics you put into this are that this is a frictionless hinge, a frictionless hinge, a frictionless hinge. This is a rigid object, a rigid object, rigid objects. When this foot hits the ground, it does not slide, it does not bounce. This knee has an extra constraint on it, which is that it can't hyperextend, it can't go past straight. If it swings and gets to that straight position, it has a plastic, dissipated, non-energy conserving collision. Uh, this is a non-energy conserving collision because angular momentum balance is incompatible with energy balance, and when in doubt, the momentum, the momentum equations, uh, you trust them, and the energy equations, you do not trust them. Uh, you can search on the computer for solutions. You can find solutions like this. You can calculate the stability of those solutions. If the masses are right, you can, you can calculate that the solutions are stable. Therefore, you can build such a machine. Now, now we're going back into three dimensions because, we, unfortunately, we live in a three-dimensional world. What you can't see in this picture is that this bipedal robot has four legs. So it's constrained, more or less, to a planar motion by having four legs that move like this. Two inside legs, two outside legs. Now, it still lives in three dimensions. If you were compulsive, you could do a three-dimensional analysis and find out that the rocking motion is stable, but it turns out that it looks stable, so we don't bother with that uh, three-dimensional analysis. This thing walks. I'll show you a video of it. Here's a computer simulation of this thing walking, showing pictures time after time. Here is a picture of a human being walking, showing pictures time after time. And the claim is that uh, this machine uh, makes you think that uh, we have figured out something about the way people walk. This is walking downhill. This point is lower than this point. And it's no motors and no computers. The analysis of this is in two dimensions. The robot lives in three dimensions. But the third, in and out of the plane, we don't concern ourselves with. Uh, it is not conservative. The energy of gravity is being lost in these uh, collisions. Bang, bang, bang. Please ask out loud. 
please ask out loud. Okay, now are there any questions? Okay, so this, this machine was designed by McGear in about 1990. This is a copy of that machine in my lab. We've copied it now uh, several times. Uh, it was this machine actually that got me basically interested in this in this subject. So now we want to go on and try to ask uh, questions about the nature of the stability. Somebody asked, why is it chaotic? A simpler question is, why is it stable? So uh, we find that you write all the equations down, you analyze them, you can do a little bit of analysis of that simple first model with pencil and paper, but most of the analysis is done by computer calculation. But we find out that these systems are stable. Remember, the bicycle was stable, asymptotically stable, and the bicycle was conservative. These systems are not conservative, but asymptotically stable. The question is, do they get their stability because of something about the intermittent contact non-polynomic dynamics, or is it from the dissipation? Or is it from the fact that these machines can stand like this? And somehow the static stability of being in this, in this configuration is just being conferred on the dynamic situation in the same way that this is stable on the table. And now we do this dynamics problem, and it's still stable, and you're not surprised the dynamic stability is being borrowed from the static stability. Is that happening in these walking machines? They're visiting this st static configuration, stable configuration, step after step. So I gave a challenge to my students. Could he design a passive dynamic walking machine that cannot stand up? So this is really directly inspired by the bicycle. The bicycle cannot stand up. It only balances when it's moving. Can we make a robot that can only balance when it's moving? Now it has to be in three dimensions. We have, back in the back, you're interested in three dimensions. It has to be in three dimensions because in two dimensions, these things can all stand uh, like this. So you have a three-dimensional design. He decided to start with basically the simplest design he could, which is one rigid object, another rigid object, a single hinge. It's very much like the penguin, only without the body, so it's just the legs. Uh, for feet, we could have put uh, general ellipsoids or something. We just, we just chose to put circular arcs, small circular arcs. Then we have to pick the center of mass somewhere, and we have to pick the center of mass to be high enough so that this thing cannot be statically stable. Uh, my students worked on this for two or three years in computer simulation, doing searches and optimizations, and he could not find a machine that could balance dynamically, but not balance statically. So he was having his PhD defense, which was going to be uh, the statement of the defense was, there is no such machine. Now remember, in bicycles, we have the advantage of spinning parts, and this does not have that advantage. So it's not unlikely that there could be no such machine. He couldn't prove it. It's proof by failure to succeed. But that was the status. A few days before his PhD defense, he decided to make a little model with this American toy called Tinker Toys. And he was trying to show with this model what it was that the computer said almost worked. So the best the computer could get was that the biggest eigenvalue had a magnitude of something like 1.1. We need for stability that the magnitude be less than 1. Then he did something which I do not understand, but he took the model and he put it on a table and he looked to see uh, what it did, and what he found is that uh, it did this. It works. So then his PhD defense became, it is possible to make a walking machine that cannot stand up, but I don't know why. So then another two years of computer simulation and we got, to, we got the computer to agree and the laws of mechanics to agree that this is possible. Okay. And it started with this experimental so not full What? If you just put it down, it's full If you put it down, not on a ramp, it cannot stand up. 
So the, the uh, this, first of all, you can see the circular arcs, and the center of mass is above the circular arcs, so it can't stand like this. And second of all, if you put it in any crooked configuration, you can draw a line uh, between the two center of contacts, and, set, and you can get an effective curvature, the center of mass is above that point also. So it can't stand up in any configuration. Please, I, would, I like questions. Yes. But I, I wonder if, uh, in a certain sense, you're not thinking a little bit by having this rotating phase, because that stabilizes in the same way as the bicycle stabilizes. Where do you see rotation parts on this? The arch just fuzzy into the tent. The arch bits are just fuzzy into the picture. These orange bits are not turning. Ah, they are not turning. Oh, I'm sorry. But from here, it looks like they are small. These are these are pieces of plastic that cost five cents and you stick on like this. This whole thing cost about four dollars to build it. Sorry. I, I actually disagree. I, it's better if I don't finish if people ask questions. But four bucks for me. This one does not look much like human walking, though. I don't think it gives us, this is a mathematical object. It's showing this point that the dynamics can give stability independent of the statics. It does not prove that the dynamics comes from intermittent contact or non contact contact because this is still dissipated. Whether there are intermittent contact systems that have asymptotic stability that are also conservative is an open question. No, but I have not seen any example of an intermittent contact system that is both conservative and asymptotically stable. So we still do not, we still do not know that. At least I do not know it, and I haven't seen an example. On a flat circle, so there are solutions where it steps back and forth between the two peaks. Uh, as I said, I, I do not know of any examples. You can you can fish for them, but whatever it is, I don't know of any. Asymptotically stable system where the asymptotic stability comes from intermittent contact. Uh, so this is now an attempt to make this look uh, more relevant. So this is in three dimensions. And the whole idea here is just to make it look more like we're talking about human beings. So the design of this is two-dimensional. Uh, it's not a, it's a three-dimensional in construction, but the analysis is two-dimensional. We did simple calculations about the rocking, but not really full three-dimensional dynamics. And uh, this thing, I think, in this world of passive dynamics, this is the most uh, convincing, most advanced uh, passive dynamic machine. Uh, it was built by this guy, who was an undergraduate at Cornell at the time. It's walking downhill. All my research is down, going downhill. Yes? Uh, the proportion between the length of the foot and this thing is, is it relative? The, the relative sizes of this? So, so let me, he, he asked, is the relative size is important here? So uh, this line of research, trying to say that passive dynamics would tell us something about animals, uh, is, is really based on the three inspirations I gave and on that this looks like a person. And it walks like a person. It's pretty convincing, I think. It looks more like a walking person than most any powered robot does. If you go to my website, you will see videos of these robots. Every time you click on the video, it runs and does not fall down. If you go to my lab, all you see is robots falling down. So basically, we lied to everybody, including ourselves, about the utility of this idea because this is incredibly not robust. It's sensitive to everything. So when we design them, we have to shop on the we have to shop with this length and this mass and this moment of inertia and this radius to get everything right. Just like for the Tinker Toy, remember he spent three years and couldn't find a solution. These ones are not, in two dimensions, are not quite so fussy, but they're sensitive to everything. And then when you're all done, and you have this thing which works, it barely works. This machine now hangs on the ceiling, 
if you say, can I see this walk? And I say, you wish, because I cannot make this walk again. He left the lab, that never walked again. <laughs> it's not quite true, it walked a couple times. But very sensitive every which way. Mathematically sensitive, and then physically sensitive to who knows what. Does that address your question? Does that answer your question? Or do you fall asleep in the Yes? Sideways oscillations. Yes. Yes. They're taken into account, yes and no. We did no complete three dimensional analysis of this, but the feet are very carefully designed with two different, each foot has two different curves here, so that in our estimation, that when this, when this uh, walks, the center of pressure, taking into account dynamics, always stays inside the foot. So even if you, if you go back uh, to the first patent of the penguin, he shows this S-shaped curve. In his mind, he's thinking the center of mass is going back and forth, so therefore the reaction force, uh, the statically equivalent force, is moving back and forth. And we shape the foot just by pencil and paper calculations. How, how much is it moving back and forth? How big is the static term, the dynamic term, and so on? So we don't know in detail, but we estimated it was kind of worse. Does that address your question? So you uh, make sure that during these oscillations, the center of the uh, the center of pressure, the zero pressure moment point, they call it. Inside this. That's correct. We try to make sure. Actually, if you look at the video in detail, uh, uh, an early, the first video showed without arms. And if you look carefully, you can tell that we missed. And sometimes the robot goes up onto one edge and, and twists on one point. And arms here are just to mimic uh, the man, or they also are? The arms are totally important. We made, without arms, uh, this thing worked two times, and I never saw it work. I never saw it. I only have a one video. With arms, it worked more reliably. And the purpose of the arms is so that if you look at the angular momentum balance about a vertical axis through the person, that the angular momentum of the leg swinging and the arm together is approximately zero. So if you do not have the arms, then when the leg swings, you have to have a body compensation like this to keep the angular momentum zero, or you need a big torque at the foot at the bottom. So it removes the need for torque at the feet. And, and since this time, the same guy, Steve, got a PhD, and in his PhD research, he showed that in human walking, the arms also serve that purpose. How many people would like to learn everything about passive dynamics and starve? And how many people would like to stop here and do so much?